All right, everybody, we're going to jump right into it. Um, my name is Kegan Hilaire. Uh, welcome to Rodale Institute's Zoom uh, webinar for organic farming, starting your farm from the ground up. Uh, my email is down here at the bottom. If you want to write that down now, give everybody a second. Uh, if you have any questions after the webinar, feel free to contact me or, or anyone here at Rodale. Um, we'll also have some more contact information on the last slide. Um, so my name is Kegan Hilaire. I'm the Small Farms and Diversified Vegetable Consultant here at the Rodale Institute. I am based in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. However, the, the consulting team is stationed all across the United States to help farmers of all regions improve their growing practices, become more profitable, and help transition them to organic. I also own and operate my own small certified organic diversified vegetable farm in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. Um, this webinar will be divided into two main parts. The first part will be fairly short. It will be an interview of sorts for you to complete on your own or with some of your farming friends. Uh, part two will be dealing with more of the on the ground logistics of starting your small farm. Um, we will use mostly examples from crop and livestock farms, but acknowledge that farms can come in all shapes, sizes and scales. Any food production is a worthwhile cause and we hope that these ideas can serve more as guidance to a mindset rather than a, an exact roadmap for success. Uh, part two, we will transition um, to part after part two, we will tra transition to the question and answer part of the webinar please make sure that you submit all questions through the Q&A portal. Uh, we will not be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll get to as many as we can after the, the end of the webinar. Um, so we're gonna jump right into it. So part one, starting from the boots up. Uh, the first thing that you wanna think about when you're starting your farm is what is your why? Um, this can be a broad topic, um, like I wanna improve food access in my local community. I wanna get more involved with the production of my own food, or even I wanna run a profitable small business or a popular YouTube channel to teach other farmers what I know. Um, farming is hard. Uh, it's important to be able to articulate exactly what gets you out of bed in the morning and be able to remind yourself of it in a meaningful way. Uh, washing salad greens after sunset by yourself can be very lonely. So knowing your why and keeping it in the back of your head are, are helpful things to help get you through the day. Um, next up, what are your goals? Uh, do you want to run a profitable small business? Are your goals more socially or community focused? Uh, what concrete goals do you have to help promote a healthier local food community? Um, everybody eats. Food is one of the only things that links each human on earth to earth. So how can your food be a vehicle for change in your local food system? Um, what are your scopes? What volume, uh, what scale is enough? Now this can change over time and, and likely will, but having an idea for this year or for your first season um, of what you think you can accomplish is, is important to have going in. Um, we wanna make sure that your work-life balance is reasonable. I feel like this is something that most farmers struggle with is finding a, a good balance between how much I can put into my farm while still having a, a meaningful home life. Um, you want a, a a farm that's both sustainable and healthy for you. Um, we tend to think of the word sustainable really relating more towards our growing practices when really sustainable really means is a measure of, of how everything relates to the farm. Um, does it pay you a living wage? Does it nourish your soul as well as your body? Um, it might be physically and mentally tiring, but does your farm fit into a model that kind of renews your excitement for what is possible through food? Um, next up, do you have an entry strategy? Do you have an exit strategy? Um, what knowledge and training do you have currently that can help you transition into farming? Um, how will you find the land, the equipment, the tools to begin? Um, and almost as important as your entry strategy is what is your exit strategy? You may plan for the farm for the rest of your life, um, but at some point, even towards the end of your life, you'll have to stop. Um, that right now it might be a transition period in your life where farming is something that fits now, but might not fit into your life later. Or maybe farming is something it's important to get the experience for now to move into other areas of, of working in sustainable agriculture. Um, having that boots on the ground experience is, is invaluable. Um, whether you're farming or working with farmers, uh, it's just great to, great to have that. Um, next and almost equally as important of getting into farming is what's your strategy for getting out? So. It's not really so morbid uh, if you think about it, of shutting down your farm and closing up shop. Um, really just having an idea of um, how movable things are, um, how, how uh, 
debt is minimized, how your expect expectations are kept realistic, and any of your infrastructure to be mobile in some way. Um, having an exit strategy also serves as a good mental check for yourself when it's time to move on. Uh, mental and physical health are, are both important things to start think about when you're starting out or continuing to run your small farm. Now, there are three questions that I like to ask each of my consulting clients. Uh, the first one, what is your level of experience? Um, have you farmed or grown before? For how long and at what scale? Um, how do some of those skills translate to what you'll need to know how to do to operate your own farm business? Uh, these skills or this experience doesn't have to be at production or at a farm scale. Um, home gardening is a great way to get started. Knowing how to transplant, how to start seeds, how to prep a bed, um, how to weed and water are all important tasks to know how to do, whether you're doing it for a single potted tomato plant or for a five acre vegetable farm. Um, do you have experience working in the different sales channels that you'll have to use for your farm? Um, have you been to a farmer's market? Have you worked at a farmer's market? Have you ever been a customer of a CSA? Um, do you have a basic idea of how these sales channels operate? Um, also, and have you, do you know any local growers or farmers who are working at your scale or size um, that you can either talk to, network with, or gain some actual on-farm experience with? The second question, how much time are you able to dedicate to your farm per week? Is this going to be a hobby farm? Is this going to be in addition to a normal full-time job? Or is this going to be a farm that you're going to be doing full-time? Um, Having an idea of how much time you're able to dedicate to your farm per week will help make decisions on scale, on land, and on crop planning. So really having a good idea in your head of, of what that entails and how much you're actually going to be able to put into it is important. Uh, the quality of your time spent on the farm should also be an important factor. If you're starting out and you're going to be learning every new task, um, to, you're going to be learning the tasks that you need to do uh, kind of in real time. Um, it's going to take a lot longer than you expect to do that task. Um, usually I like to get, come up with an estimate for how long it'll take me and then add another 30%. And usually I'm still running late. So if you're learning new tasks as you're accomplishing them, it will take you longer and you'll have to take that into account when you're, when you're planning out your, your farm scale. Um, sometimes your energy may be better spent for a year working on another farm, interning at another farm, we're just on, re on YouTube researching, learning, learning some tricks of the trade and some things that'll be helpful specifically to your farm. Uh, the Rodale Institute offers the RIFT program, which is the Rodale Institute Farmer Training Program uh, to help new farmers learn the skills necessary to start and run their own farms. Um, I'm a graduate of the RIFT program and uh, that program was instrumental in helping me start my farm. Um, does your farm allow for outside help? Do you have uh, scale or plans to hire someone in? Um, do you have a, maybe you have a community of supported CSA customers who want to come and volunteer? Um, do you have friends who will come and work for pizza and beer? That's one we tend to utilize a lot on my own farm. Um, can you, are you good at organizing? Can you put together volunteer days for people to come out, learn about the farm, have some kind of educational aspect, but also help you accomplish some of the, some of the tasks that need to get done? Also, another option is, is work shares through a CSA where people, maybe instead of paying, are actually coming out weekly and, and earning their share of vegetables each week. Um, and finally, question three, what resources are you able to dedicate to your farm? Uh, resources doesn't always have to mean money. Um, it can be land to use. It could be tractors or implements, uh, equipment, tools. Those are all resources that can help you get started in farming. Um, can you work with a farmer in exchange for land, materials, or equipment use? Um, that's something, a co-op model or just sharing with other farmers is, is important to not only um, learning about farming, but also learning maybe what you want to use or don't want to use in the future, especially before you invest a lot of money into, into some of the larger equipment. Um, are there any grants available for your project? Um, that's another one that would definitely fall under resources. So getting an idea of all of those things before you get started are really important. Um, I know a lot of what we started there is kind of overwhelming. So hopefully part two can present us with a few more options to accomplish each step. So part two, deciding on your model. What kind of farm do you want to run? Are you interested in diversified vegetables, livestock? Do you want to sell straight to food distributors? Take all your produce to farmer's market. Have you explored the CSA model? 
Um, deciding roughly what you, what you want to grow or raise and how you're going to sell it will be a good first step. So a little thought experiment is where, where do you see your farm five years from now? Um, they can come in all shapes and sizes. Um, be honest with your skills, experience, and motivation. But it's good to have some kind of grand plan for your farm down the road. So take a second and kind of think about what, what your farm looks like. Um, maybe you're daydreaming about your farm and you, you see cows grazing on, on pasture as you drive by in your tractor to the field. Now kind of stop and kind of reverse engineer that where, where did you get a tractor that size? Where did you get those cows? How, how are they fenced in? Is the fence electrified? Kind of work your way through each of the things that you see in your daydream and kind of put together a plan for, for what it would take to accomplish that. Um, list out each scope and scale. So if you're gonna do vegetables and add chickens or chickens and add vegetables, kind of um, get that scope and put out, list out all the projects you'll need to get it up to the scale and prioritize based on that. Um, it's a good thing to think about farming as systematic improvement. So anything that you can do today to set yourself up better for tomorrow, will eventually snowball and help you run an even more successful small farm. Now, production planning. Uh, the first step for setting yourself up for a great season is your production plan. This is the nuts and bolts of your farm. Um, there are different options for uh, the planning side. Uh, there are some software for vegetable farms. Excel is still very popular and probably the most simple to use. Um, crop plans include, but aren't limited to, seeding, transplanting, and harvest dates spacing in each row for each crop, uh, the location in the field, and some yield and harvest records. Uh, livestock records might include some seeding dates for feed or for pasture, uh, birthing schedules, uh, schedules for AI, laser, uh, layer production if you're going to have laying hens, or a grazing plan if you're going to have your animals out on pasture. And these are all part uh, important parts of your production plan. Um, after you design your production plan, you wanna take a step back, um, start questioning, does this, does this scale align with your production goals? Does it provide the quality of life that you expected? Um, does your vision for the farm align with what's possible in the field based on these plans? Um, it's important to be able to see your farm plan come to life. Uh, it'll help you keep more focused as you're working through it, but also more systematic in how you approach each day. Uh, it can almost serve as, as a miniature to-do list as you, as you work your way through the farm. Now, selling your food. Unless you're planning on growing only enough for yourself, which is fine, um, you will need to sell it. Uh, in this section, we'll talk about three of the more used sales channels um, in, in, in farming. So the first one, retail. Retail is usually the highest margin for your produce. You get to interact and build relationships with the end user which is uh, very rewarding, but also helps to build a lot of enthusiasm and uh, loyalty from your customers when they get to talk to the person who's actually growing what they eat. Um, it's a good way to stay inspired and motivated through a long season. Selling at retail can be labor intensive though. Um, harvesting, washing, packing, and hauling to a, an early morning farmer's market takes a lot of time and takes a lot of energy. And everything must be prepared to be given to the end user. So I think that's something a lot of farmers kind of forget about with retail is you're going to have to prepare that food the most out of anything that you harvest. So keeping that in mind when you go to retail is important. Um, some retail markets are obviously farmers markets. That's probably the most popular. Um, that's a great way to get your name out in the local community. It gives a chance for the market customers to interact with the farmers or the workers who are bringing the food to them every week. Um, it can be very profitable since it'll give you a chance to build that relationship um, with, with your regular customers. Um, you're going to start having people that come every week. Uh, that's, that's a really good feeling that people come to you specifically for what they're going to eat that week. Uh, that's, that's an exciting feeling. Um, it can also help build trust with those people um, while also bringing in a, a higher margin for the farmer. Um, not all markets need to be so formal as a Saturday 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. model. Um, Pop-up markets are becoming more and more popular and I think are, are more and more feasible. Um, local grocers, health food shops, bike stores, your friend's bakery, um, any of these places can be good spots for a, for a pop-up produce event. Um, it's a good way to help you sell some extra produce, but also get to interface with some new customers that maybe don't go to your normal farmer's markets. 
Um, another good way to sell retail is at a farm stand. Um, this is a pretty easy way to sell without any extra labor. If you have a place on the side of the road, mostly farmers just will lay out their produce or keep a freezer full of uh, meat or proteins or eggs or milk. Um, and they can either have an honor box system where customers will drop in cash and take what they need, or the credit card sales have made it so much easier now that they can just swipe their card and grab what they want. Um, this is great because the farmers don't have to staff it, and it's just kind of almost like passive income if you can, if you can set it up the right way. Uh, the next retail option, there's a CSA or a community supported agriculture or a farm share. Um, basically, this allows customers to buy a share of the harvest from your farm that year. Um, in, in turn, each, each week, the farmer will provide either a set amount of produce with vegetables. It's usually six to 10 items per week is the average um, or a certain dollar amount. So if you're doing a meat CSA, um, higher cut or cuts are worth different different amounts. So providing a certain dollar amount every week to make sure that they're getting the, the return that they expect from, from investing in your farm for the year. Um, another great thing about a CSA or farm share model is that the customers usually tend to pay up front. So right around now, uh, late winter, early spring, uh, customers will start joining your CSA. They'll pay all up front for the season. So the farmer will have the money that they need to purchase supplies and seeds and stock and everything that they'll need to get growing this season. Um, they'll have the money for it before the season starts. So it's a great way to finance some of your early purchases um, while also providing a, a really good um, feedback for, for your customers. Um, cash flow on farms tends to be as seasonal as vegetables. So an influx of capital when it's needed most um, can help balance some of the seasonality of the cash flows for, for small farmers. Um, the next outlet we'll talk about is wholesale. Wholesale is a great way to work with local retailers, restaurants, or chefs. Um, think of wholesalers as customers who will buy your produce to resell. Um, wholesale accounts tend to be interested in fewer items. So maybe they only want to buy one, two, or three things from you every week, um, but they want to order in higher quantity than retail sales. Um, wholesale accounts usually look for consistency. So what you can bring them every week doesn't change too much. Or if it does, you're on the same page as far as seasonality charts and you're very clear about when things are coming on and off your availability list. Uh, wholesale prices do tend to be a little bit cheaper than retail pricing between 20, 10 and 25%, but there are so many benefits that help make up that difference. Uh, number one being a large amount of sales all at once, rather than trying to to sell 10 heads of broccoli at market, maybe one farm or one chef will buy that right off the back of the van all at once. So it can save you a lot of time on the back end. Um, also, advanced ordering by putting out an availability list will let the farmer uh, harvest correctly and know exactly how much they need. So it'll help reduce on your food waste as well. Um, as I mentioned, wholesaling usually requires some kind of availability list. So sending out an update, usually weekly or in any uh, regular interval with the pricing, quantity, and packing sizes of each item. Um, for example, if you're selling mixed Salanova heads for $24 a case, there are 30 heads in a case, 15 are red, 15 are green. Have that spelled out right on your availability list so there is no confusion. Wholesaling also allows the farmer to take one day or afternoon or evening a week to devote specifically to delivery or on-farm pickups for wholesale. The farmer, chef, restaurant and shop owners need to have clear expectations about what each side is bringing to the table, whether it's quantity, quality, or pricing. Um, but working with wholesalers can also be a good way to get your name out to the public. Um, retailers and chefs usually really like to promote the farms that they're working with, either by putting your name on the menu or by having a sign by your produce in their store. Uh, so having products in places like this, especially near your retail sales channels, can help reinforce the marketing that you're already doing. Maybe someone gets a really good dish made with your carrots at a local restaurant. Um, maybe now they're motivated to come find the person who grew them or get them fresh and try to make that dish on their own. But it gives you a chance to further communicate with that customer about what makes your carrots or your farm different. Um, some wholesale outlets, uh, retailers. So getting in with a good retailer can be a game changer for small farms. 
Um, having someone who can sell your produce regularly uh, can help take the stress off of a farmer's market centric uh, model. Um, it might seem scary to discount your produce a little bit, but it can far outweigh uh, the benefits of not having to sell it all yourself. There's no farmer's market to go set up at. You don't have to drive. There's no slow days because of rainy or holidays. Um, retailers also give the farmer another person who can translate their work in the field to the final consumer. Anyone who is able and willing to tell your farm story is crucial. Um, another wholesaler, uh, wholesale account could be restaurants. Uh, restaurants and farms may seem like a match made in heaven, but they're, and they usually are, but they aren't always as simple as they seem. Um, seasonality is the name of the game, especially in small farms, but you need to have them on board and have them understand that seasonality. Um, having your farming systems on your end dialed in enough where you can project out two weeks, things that are becoming on and off the availability list and being able to communicate that to your, to your wholesalers. Um, some, some farmers will even work with, especially restaurants to contract grow special varieties for them that they want on their menu. Um, for any setup like that, you definitely want to get a contract in writing. Um, chefs tend to bounce around from place to place. So having uh, a written agreement with them that they will buy all of that specialty variety that next season. Um, but if you can make that work, that's, that's a great way to connect with local, local chefs. Um, now, actually, chefs is my last of the wholesaling uh, channels. Uh, Pre-COVID chefs and restaurants were probably synonymous. Um, that's kind of changed in the last year or two. Um, the rise at at-home pop-up chefs or ghost kitchens. Um, has kind of changed who, who farms can sell their produce to. Um, chefs in these positions can be even more flexible than at a restaurant. So even if you, you, what you're offering doesn't currently align with their menu, they have the most flexibility to, to either incorporate that in or find a way to work with you in the future. Um, continuing to communicate and give them enough warning about what's coming on and off your availability list is also, also very important. So the last one we'll talk about today are distributors. So distributors are a business that wholesalers will buy from. So they sell to people who will resell your products. Um, there are food distributors of all sizes, um, Cisco, US Food, we've seen them at most of the, most of the chain restaurants around. Um, but there are also, especially recently, a really big rise in the size of um, small regional based food distributors, places like Harvest Dropper Zone 7 that were specifically founded to work with small farms in a specific area and bringing those local small farms to local restaurants and chefs. Um, distributors usually require large and regular orders. Um, distributors tend to pick up on farm. Um, depending on their scale and supply, distributors have the ability to purchase thousands of dollars of, of, of products a week. Um, they usually have either contracts or at least handshake agreements with what you'll be supplying and what they'll be purchasing on, on a regular basis. Um, another thing to think about with wholesalers is that they may have longer payment terms than some of your smaller accounts, either net 30 or net 90. So it may take a little bit longer to get paid from those accounts. So the next part we'll go to is land. Finding land can be the, one of the biggest hurdles for small farms. Um, prices for usable farmland, especially in the Northeast, are very expensive and tough to come by. Um, the search for land can seem pretty daunting, but there are some options that maybe you haven't thought of yet. Um, the first option, renting, a land, renting land from another farmer. Um, this is definitely a possibility, especially if that farmer is changing the scale or the scope of their farm. Um, there's a lot of farms that are in flux right now. So going around and just networking and finding out what the availability is in your area is very important. Um, Maybe a field takes too long to drive through. It doesn't fit their needs or they're, they're changing how their farm operates a little bit and it's just an extra space. Um, find out those, ask those questions and find out to see what's in your area. Um, there are also places like PA FarmLink that will help connect people who have land to people who need land. Um, lease agreements and size will all vary, but keep your eye out for, for opportunities like that. Next is USDA financing. Uh, depending on your size and scope, maybe you want to check with the USDA to see if you're eligible for uh, any special financing, either on a land or either on land, a home, or both. 
um, many of the interest rates are below market rates and can allow for little to no down payment, making it really flexible for, for beginning farmers to get access. The third one I'm especially partial to, uh, I operate my farm at an incubator farm. An incubator farm is a farming program where farmers can rent land, they can rent equipment, materials, infrastructure. If you don't have $20,000 to spend on a new tractor and implements, you can rent it from an incubator farm. If you don't have infrastructure set up yet, you can rent space from an incubator farm. Um, these models are becoming more and more important, more and more popular and can be very helpful for new farmers. Um, some of them actually will also provide some amount of guidance from a farm manager or a farm mentor who will help them kind of dial in their systems, uh, work on their sales channels, work on their marketing. Um, so this is one that I, I always encourage uh, new farmers to check out before investing too much money into anything else. Um, what's also nice about a incubator farm is you can work out the kinks of your farming system. Um, you're probably not gonna farm the same year one uh, as you did in your farm plan, and you certainly won't farm the same way you did in year one and year two. So it'll help you work through the kinks in your system but also help you put together a business history that will make it even easier to apply for grants and loans and things like that. Uh, number four, purchasing your own land. If you can purchase your own land, that's great. Um, we'll talk about a few uh, spots in the things to look out for in the next slide. So things to look at in your land. When you're looking at a plot of land, whether it's at an incubator farm or you're purchasing it or you're renting it, the first one is location, location, location. Uh, land should be close enough to markets, uh, but not too close that it's overly expensive. Um, there's not nothing that can happen on your farm if all the farm employees are currently driving. So you need people on your farm. They need to be close enough um, to make it feasible. Um, land close to large communities will be more expensive. So finding a balance between the price and the distance is an important step in your site selection process. Uh, the only thing that you can't change about your land is the location of it. So keeping that in the back of your head at all times is, is very important when you're starting this process. Uh, extra size requirements. So you, you have an idea for your production and how, how much you need, but you also want to allow for some other things that maybe you hadn't thought of, whether it's a driveway or a wash pack station or a walk-in cooler or stalls or a barn. Those things are all going to take up space. So maybe you need five acres to farm, but you really need more than five acres to fit the infrastructure needed for farming on that land. Um, a big one is hard line fencing, whether it's deer fence or just permanent fence. It takes a, a lot more space than you might realize. So keeping that in mind as you're, as you're looking at the size of, of each plot. Um, ideally, land would face south to absorb the maximum amount of sunlight throughout the season. Um, and ideally, your farm would drain well, whether it's on a slight grade um, or just drains naturally well, um, but not too steep where erosion can be an issue. So don't treat your soil like dirt. The first thing you should do once you get a plot of land is to learn about your soil. What type of soils do you have? How does it beha behave in, in rainstorms? How does it behave with snow cover? How does it, how, what weeds are coming from it? Um, so I encourage everyone to learn about as much about their soil as they possibly can. Um, take soil samples to learn about the fertility of the soil. Will you need to amend it? Um, these can be sent to almost any land grant university. Around here, we send all of our samples to Penn State. Um, so you can test for all kinds of things, whether it's bioavailable plant nutrients to heavy metals to the organic matter. Um, some options make, may make more sense in your area. Uh, if you're farming in an urban area or using soil from an urban or industrial area, maybe getting a heavy metals test would be more helpful. Um, if you're farming at the top of the hill, maybe testing your organic matter is really important. Um, there's no really one size fits all option. Get to know your soil now and it'll pay off for years to come. Um, we recommend that you get your soil tested at least once a year, especially if there's any deficiencies or things that you're keeping an eye on. Um, so just keeping that in the back of your head that um, you should be regularly testing your soil. Some other land considerations. Uh, um, irrigation is a big one. 
um, everyone, oh yeah, this will be a great pile of land. I just have no way to get water to it. Um, that's gonna change a lot about your farming process. Uh, you're gonna need water on site for irrigation and for livestock. Wells, ponds, creeks, rivers can all be options depending on your setup, um, but this water needs to be clean and to be in ready supply at all times. Um, seasonal ponds can dry up when the summer droughts hit. Small creeks and streams can disappear overnight. Uh, you really want a strong, plentiful supply of water for your land. Um, if you're irrigating crops, you're gonna need a way to pressurize those lines to ensure that uh, everything is operating efficiently. Uh, if you're familiar with drip tape, that requires 13 to 15 PSI to properly water your crops. Uh, so having a way to, to pressurize that correctly is important. Um, overhead watering systems require even more pressure. So choose your irrigation system wisely, but also make sure you have a, a strong water source that is able to, to cover the area that it needs to. Um, we touched on extra space a little bit in the previous slide, but making sure that you have room for a tool shed or a tractor barn. Uh, if you're renting land in another area, you're gonna wanna store equipment on site. Uh, there's nothing that will ruin a day in the field, like realizing you forgot a tool that you needed or seeds that you needed at home and you have to drive back or maybe you forgot them in the first place. Um, items that get used regularly should always be stored on the farm. Things like hose, trowels, harvest crates, packing materials should, should always be on site. Uh, this will require some kind of storage facility and a little extra space to house that. Um, so remember to leave a little bit of room in, in your space for this in your future farm plans. Um, some other infrastructure ideas based on production, um, if you're doing vegetables, maybe a walk-in cooler, a greenhouse to start your transplants, a high tunnel, maybe for season extension or for some protected growing area. If you're looking more towards livestock, freezers and refrigerators and feed storage are big infrastructure needs that you'll need um, to to operate your farm correctly. So getting certified organic, we're of course coming from the Rodale Institute, so we're gonna encourage everyone to get certified organic. Um, the first step, um, now that we figured out kind of where our land is going to be, um, and we have a plan for what we're gonna grow, it's we're gonna start thinking about getting certified. The process might vary slightly from certifying agent to certifying agent, but there are many things that will be the same. Um, all farms are, will be required to submit an OSP or an organic systems plan um, to their certifier before their inspection. This will include any materials used, uh, maps of the farm and fields, previous field and farm records, um, the source of stock, whether it's transplant or livestock, um, and, and more. Uh, this is really the bulk of your organic application every year is either updating or creating your OSP. Once the OSP is approved, your certifying agent will assign you a time for your inspection. Uh, your inspector will come out and basically ensure that what you stated on the OSP is what's happening in the fields on the ground, um, as well as verifying other compliance with um, national organic program standards. Um, certified organic farmers need to keep careful records of their farming practice. Um, things like seeding dates, planting dates, tillage records, pesticides use, materials used, um, harvest records, among other things. Um, here's a list for some crops and for livestock. This, there's obviously more than just this, but just some things to start thinking about um, kind of using regularly on your farm, whether you're certified or not. But this might seem like a long list. There's honestly even more than, than I have listed here, but it's many of these things are really just ways to ensure that the business and farm are on a healthy trajectory. Um, some people say it's too much paperwork. Um, they're likely some of the people who can't tell you if or how much money they're making from their farm. So keeping these records are really more of good business practice than they are for organic certification, but your certifier is going to make sure that you're keeping track of them either way. Okay, so now that we know what we want to raise, the quality we'll have, where it will happen, how you will sell it, uh, the next step is going to be legal considerations. So what does a farm business need to get started? Uh, with any new business, you wanna make sure you're operating legally. You'll need a bank account, you'll need a credit card reader, you'll need insurance, and a host of other things that can't happen until you form a business. So what structure your business is, is an important decision. Is an LLC or a sole proprietorship, would it work better as a nonprofit? 
these are all questions you should talk to a lawyer about. Um, they would be able to explain the intricacies of forming each one. Um, again, with farms, there's no one size fits all model. So talking to someone who has a background in it um, is really important to making sure you start, a, start your farm off on the right foot. Um, give yourself plenty of time. Uh, filing for an LLC in Pennsylvania can take six to eight weeks. So plan your schedule accordingly. Uh, be sure to have questions ready for your lawyer. Um, if you discuss any additional areas, uh, you may need legal advice. Um, do you need terms and conditions for a CSA? Um, do you need a waiver for on-farm activities? Uh, are you need help looking over your lease? Uh, these are all great re reasons to find and work with a lawyer, especially one who is well-versed in agricultural matters. The less fun topics, uh, insurance, bookkeeping, and your website design. Um, insurance is something that all farms are going to need. Uh, farming is one of the more dangerous professions in the world. So having an insurance policy to cover accidents protects you and your business. Uh, most farmer, farmers markets actually require farms to have a $1 million umbrella policy to sell at their market. Uh, wholesalers and retailers and distributors will check in on this as a normal part of their vetting process for new farms. So find a company who covers farms and get a few quotes, or if you're not sure who to call, call an insurance broker and see what they can, what they can find for you. Next is bookkeeping. Uh, bookkeeping, keeping proper records is an important part of any business, especially one that is as cash strapped as farming tends to be. So having the, a correct system in place to collect, record, and enter all your accounting information will help keep your farm on the right side of the law and on the right side of profitability. Um, you'll want to make sure that these accounts are set up correctly. Um, I use QuickBooks on my own farm. Uh, that's a pretty popular one for most small businesses. Uh, it's a great way to manage your internal accounting. The monthly subscription is relatively cheap and it integrates well with most applications. Um, I would recommend having a professional accountant set up your QuickBooks account um, just to make sure that everything is working and tagging and hitting things as it should. Um, but once it's set up, QuickBooks is very user-friendly, whether you know accounting or not. Um, this is something you could run through with your accountant pretty quickly and just hit the ground running with using, using your accounting software. Another thing I always suggest for farmers to do is to make a debt schedule. A debt schedule is basically just a month by month breakdown of what you expect to come in and what you expect to put out. Um, the in expected inflows and outflows of the money will change throughout the year. Um, sure, using CSA money to pay for all of your seeds and equipment in the beginning of the year might sound like a good idea, but what happens when most of your CSA customers join in April and May? Uh, the time for ordering seeds has passed. Um, equipment is starting to get sparse. So um, having an idea of when you'll need money and when the money will come or you can spend it uh, will be important to project out the rest of your year. So next is website design. Creating a website is not like it used to be. Uh, this is one that I think surprises a lot of the people that I work with, where we're not, we don't need to know how to code or how to vector or resize or any of those things that you used to have to know how to do when starting a website. Um, many website builders have pre-made templates where you can actually uh, add your own pictures and text. Uh, if you can create a PowerPoint presentation, you can create a website. Um, some credit card companies will actually let you create a free website uh, if you use their services. In my experience, they're even easier to use and they're incentivized to make sure that your online sales channels are always up and operating. They're your credit card processor, so they want to make sure that your online store is able to sell. Um, paying for things like a specific domain name are also possible with, with services like this. Marketing your farm. So the first thing you're going to want to do is come up with some kind of logo idea. Start brainstorming ideas for your business. Come up with a logo that'll help distinguish you from the rest of the marketplace. Uh, if you can come up with a catchy name and a fitting logo design, um, usually something clean and simple. Uh, you want it to look good on a label of a lettuce bag, but also on a t-shirt. Um, creating a logo could be as simple as downloading a logo creator off the internet or as complex as hire hiring a graphic designer. Um, my advice to anyone is always to find someone local, find, a, find an artist nearby who you can compensate for their work. And it's another way to connect your farm into the local community. Um, websites like Fiverr also exist to connect freelancers with people who need to get work done. Um, decide on your project, your budget, 
post what your idea is and just wait for responses. Uh, this is a good way to hire someone who is interested in your project and a good way to verify that the work's been completed without risk of someone just walking off with your money. Um, always make sure that your logo and design is usable. Usually this means that you're going to want to get it vectored. Vectoring, vectoring is a process in which an algorithm actually fills in the gaps of your logo as it's resized. Once a design has been vectored, you can blow it up to the size of a billboard without having any loss of picture quality. Having a vectored file will expedite the process of printing shirts, business cards, and receipts. And if you're expediting the process, it also means you're saving money. You're not paying someone else to redesign it every time. You can send a vectored file, they can resize it as needed and print it immediately. So it'll help you save some money in the long term as well. A big part of marketing your, your farm is going to be social media. Um, everyone uses social media. Um, and some of the more multimedia heavy uh, sites are, I feel, more helpful for, for farmers, especially beginning farmers. TikTok and Instagram, where you can post videos or pictures, especially catchy videos or pictures, um, can really help drive engagement with your farm. Uh, what social media works best might depend on your size, your crea creativity, or the time you have to dedicate to marketing on that. Um, Instagram is popular since it can both form, be used as a picture form of your farm, but also in the captions, you can, you can talk a little bit too, where it's not only a picture, or only a video. There's a little bit of interaction that can happen there. Um, the best social media accounts tend to stick to a cohesive farm story. Uh, or a driving narrative and some standardized branding. Um, staying consistent with the brand um, will help um, create a more cohesive page um, and keep people coming back. Social media is a great way to tell your farm story and to share it with people who are interested. So posting regularly and to keep your audience feeling like they're part of the farming season with you. Um, it helps to get to know the farm even more deeply and gives you a chance to connect with them at a, at a whole nother level. Um, when done correctly, social media can be a great place to sell things. Um, if you're doing a line of value-added products, make sure you have a good Instagram following because as soon as you post a picture of it, you can start seeing it sell out of your online store. Um, you can tag items for purchase on your online store, and you can continuously remind your customers that you're out there and have product to sell. Google Ads. This is a big one that I think often gets overlooked. Um, it's mostly focused on STO, WTF. Um, Google Ads can be a very helpful tool for those who want to get into the search engine optimization of their marketing. Search engine optimization uh, includes words and keywords that will help drive traffic to your site based on what customers are looking up online. Um, Google Ads has a great introduction to SEO and keeps it fairly basic for an average user. Um, so once you, but once you learn how to use ads, you can really start capitalizing on on what people are searching for in the area around you. Um, you can play with what ads and dial in what audience they get put out to. So you can gear campaigns towards people who look for different keywords. Uh, this can get tricky to to learn at first. But once you learn it, it's something that will forever be helpful to your farm and to your website. I know we covered a bunch of things in the last 45 minutes, but the biggest thing, if you take away anything from this, is just get started. Um, start in your yard or on a windowsill, find an internship or a job, find a work share, um, go to YouTube and look up some tips and tricks. Just start going down the rabbit hole of learning all this information. Go to farmers markets and network with farmers, see what they're selling, see what's in season when. Um, just kind of wrapping your head around those things is, is important in the beginning, but don't get stuck in the forever planning. Um, it's really easy to get bogged down in a crop plan, especially in January when it's snowy and cold and miserable, and you kind of just want to stop looking at Excel, but just start putting seeds to soil and getting going, um, and hopefully your farm can snowball from there. Um, Everyone too, at this point, take a deep breath. Um, most of these tasks sound fairly intense. They really aren't. Playing on Zillow or sending an email or making a phone call uh, is really what all of entails some of, with some of these. Um, so many tasks seem time sensitive. Start slow. Like I said, some of them can be as simple as an email or a phone call. Some of these 
suggestions might seem a little unrealistic, but these are broad ideas. There are really options for anyone depending on your situation or your scale. Are you concerned about lack of resources? Reach out to the Rodale Institute. Contact USDA or your local NRCS office and agent. Find a local extension agent and see what options you have in your area. Uh, there's never been a better time to get into farming and collaborating with others to help your farm vision comes true, um, enriches your farm, but also, also the people who are involved. So just take a deep breath, start chipping away. And here are some resources to, to kind of get you started. Uh, the first place is the Rodeo Institute's virtual campus. Uh, there's a link that'll be included as well. Um, they have everything from how to be a good organic consumer uh, to how to transition to organic. Uh, these classes are all online. You can take them um, kind of at your own speed. Um, another one too is the Rodeo In Institute Farm Consulting Program. So we have consultants all across the country who work with a huge variety of farmers doing all kinds of different things on their farms. Um, and we can help walk you through every step of the process. YouTube, uh, a lot of my early farming knowledge came from YouTube. I learned from people who were already doing it and the people who were doing it well and could kind of get an idea of what I wanted my system to look like and how I wanted it to operate. Next is books. There's some great books out there and I'll be happy to make any recommendations to anyone who has some questions. But um, last but not least, reach out to me. Like I said, my name's Kegan. Uh, that is my phone number right there. Uh, give me a call, shoot me a text. I'm usually available to text or send me an email, kegan.hilaire at rodaleinstitute.org and let's see what we can get growing. Um, this is the end of my presentation. So we're gonna switch over to the Q&A. Um, feel free to put them in there. Um, I'll keep answering kind of as they come up. We have about 15 minutes, so we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, Jake, can you share some resources for sh learning more about proper wash pack station setup and budget ranges? We can definitely talk about that, Jake, um, but some of the broader ones, um, YouTube is a good way. Um, there's a lot of good wash pack stations set up that um, other market gardeners or farmers are using, especially for produce, um, whether it's dry, how to dry lettuce to how to spray off your roots, your root vegetables. Um, there's a lot of good resources on YouTube. If you just look up like wash pack station setup, um, get an idea of what's going on out, out in, the, in the real world and see what might make sense for your own farm scale. Let's see. And Jake, if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. What was an unexpected challenge that you faced in setting up your farm? Um, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, time management. Uh, I always think that things are gonna go exactly how I plan them and they will take exactly that long. Um, things never go as you plan them, especially on a farm. So uh, really budgeting some extra time. That was uh, certainly a learning curve for me in the beginning. What is your favorite crop to grow? Hmm. M my favorite crop would probably be carrots. Um, they're tricky to grow in our rocky soil. Um, you have to get the irrigation just right to get them to germinate. You have to prepare the beds the right way so they can get deep enough so you don't have little stubby carrots. Um, but to get them to grow is so gratifying and to be able to pull something out of the ground that's maybe this long, um, they smell delicious, they taste so good. Um, so prob probably carrots would be my favorite crop to grow. Check in with me next season, maybe next year I'll, I'll hate carrots, but for now it's carrots. Uh, let's see. If I want to do no-till, how will I begin on land that was planted in Bermuda grass and has lots of weeds? Um, it's a little more specific, but that's something that we could certainly talk through. Um, if you're starting somewhere that's grass and weeds, um, the first thing you're going to want to do is start to till that up. Um, I know no-till is a big buzzword right now, but at some point, starting a farm, you're going to have to break ground. So tilling that up, getting that incorporated, maybe tarping it um, would probably the, be the way that I would start handling something like that. Uh, let's see. Do I have any experience growing hemp? I do not currently have an experience growing hemp um, other than just seeing it growing at other farms. 
Um, that's one that it's nice to be part of somewhere like the Rodale Institute, where we have an entire research team working on, on projects of how to grow hemp, what are the germination rates? Um, it was interesting that I learned from them was a lot of the practical knowledge, the day-to-day -day knowledge of seeding rates and things like that um, was kind of lost in the 80 years that hemp was illegal. So now that it's back, and Rodale and a bunch of the partner farms that we work with are working on kind of rebuilding that knowledge bank that we lost during prohibition. So um, check in, if not with me, then someone else at Rodale will be able to answer any and all of your hemp questions. What crop will you abandon or reduce next season and why? Hmm. I think at least on production scale, I'm gonna abandon ground cherries. Um, they're very delicious. They're very nutritious. They look really cool, but they are super hard to pick and you can only get them little one, one at a time. Um, it's just not uh, efficient at, at my scale anymore. Um, how long was the Roto Institute program? And what was the draw for this program? Um, let's see, the program for the RIFT, the Rodale Institute Farmer Training, is uh, there's full season and half season options. Um, obviously, weighted more heavily towards the full season option. So you can come in at the beginning of the season. Um, the first interns will actually be arriving in the next two weeks. So they're going to be a part of seeding, they're going to be the greenhouse management, they're going to be um, preparing the fields and then eventually planting, harvesting, distributing, um, and then getting ready to cover crop for the fall of next year um, to kind of see that full scale, the full season of a, of a, a farm growing. Um, I recommend this to anyone. Um, there are classes and field trips that are built into your schedule so you're not just a farm laborer. Um, I believe there's two classes uh, a week. Um, you're going to have regular quizzes and tests um, it's a it's a fairly intensive program, but it's like I said, you graduate from there with the idea being that you're ready to start or run a farm business. So um, definitely worthwhile. It's a paid internship. If I didn't make that clear enough, um, I know that's hard to find in farming, but housing's available. So no matter where you're from, uh, what your economic status is, it, it's a paid place with somewhere to live. So I encourage RIF to to anyone that that I talk to. Uh, let's see. Favorite source for first time carrot grower? Um, some of my favorite spots are Johnny's Seeds. They have a pretty wide variety and they're pretty, usually pretty in stock. Um, high mowing is a good one. But then for some, if you wanted to grow some weird, ver there's a black carrot that is from Baker Creek Seeds. Um, and really something that I wanna get more into this year is seed saving and seed exchanging. So there's some amazing people in our local area who actually save their seed. Um, it's locally adapted. Um, it's, it's free once you put in the labor to save the seed. Um, so I think I'm gonna start focusing more on that. Um, but yeah, I would say Johnny's High Mowing, Baker Creek, Harris, there's a bunch of seed companies out there. Um, True Love Seeds does, um, not carrots specifically, but they do a lot of really cool mm -hmm. plants um, and they're, they're right down in, in the Philadelphia area. Um, we're looking at converting monoculture agricultural farmland to an organic flower farm. What production outcome expectations should we set ourselves for year one, year two, and year three as we add health to the soil? Um, I would say for that, let's let's start with a let's start with a, a soil sample. Um, see what, how degraded that land is. Maybe it's not so bad. Maybe they were practicing no-till monoculture, which is still not great, but um, at least preserving some of the soil structure. Um, I would say year one, um, that would really be dependent on what we saw in this in the soil sample. Um, any kind of residue or leftover chemicals in the soil may actually dictate how your first few years turn out, but that's something that we can work through with you. Um, I would say year one, start small, um, see what, what your scale is, what you're capable of doing. Um, and then year two, really year one, I would say survive. Year two would be improve. And then year three is when you really start building out for, for the future of your farm. So it's really a step-by-step -step process. You're not gonna hit the ground um, running year one, just do what you can, when you can. Uh, we have a saying on my farm that uh, good enough is perfect. 
So if it's done, it's good enough. Let's move on to the next task because that task list really adds up as you go through the year. Um, but if you're interested in some more help with getting your flower farm started, especially taking conventional um, land out of production and put into organic farming, please reach out to us. That's a project I would, I'd love to work on. Um, let's see. Favorite resources for first time carrot growers. Um, I actually learned a bunch of good tricks of growing carrots on YouTube where people are using silage tarps to help with germination rates. Um, that I would say YouTube, um, go to people who are growing in your system. If you're a field and tractor based system, um, look, look up someone who's growing the way that you're going to grow. If you're gonna be more in a permanent raised bed system, um, then find, find someone who's growing in that style and do as much research with them as you can, um, whether that's in person or over email or just watching YouTube videos or reading books. Let's see. Uh, any chance you can share more about the Rodale Institute Certified Advisor Program? So the Rodale Institute has a Certified Advisor Program kind of works um, similar to the consultancy program where you're an experienced grower in your area, um, whether that's livestock, corn, soy, whether that's vegetables, um, where you actually can work part-time for Rodale and help other farmers answer some agronomic questions, especially local localized knowledge. Um, so much can change whether you're growing small grains here in Pennsylvania or somewhere out in the Midwest or somewhere on the West Coast. Um, that answer might be three, it might be three different answers of how you would do it. So having someone in each local area that can speak from experience of how they did it um, is important. So yeah, I would check out the Rodale website uh, for more information on the Certified Advisor Program. That's a fairly new program, so uh, stay tuned for more information on that soon. Uh, can you help with converting to pasture from conventional farming? Uh, we absolutely can. Uh, we like to pull any amount of land we can out of conventional farming, whether we're putting that into pasture or vegetables or anything else. So um, feel free to reach out to us um, and we can set something up to come out and talk to you about that, um, especially if we're talking about pasturing uh, some livestock on there. Um, that, that sounds like a really fun project too. So yeah, like I said, don't be afraid to reach out. My email is here. Uh, my cell phone number is there as well. So just, uh, just come out. Um, any tips for composting? Um, composting, de again, depends on scale. Um, one of the lessons I learned this year was that I probably won't produce enough compost uh, for my own operation. I, I use yards and yards of compost every year, and I don't really have that many food scraps or don't really have that much food waste which is, I guess, a good thing, but it makes it hard when you have to order compost. Um, so keeping an idea of your scale again, um, how that compost is gonna be used. Um, and then there's multiple different um, ways to, to do compost. I would suggest checking out some of our other webinars. I know we've done some on compost. Um, we also have a field day in July that you can come out. There's gonna be a whole composting program. Um, we have a pretty in-depth uh, composting program here at Rodale. Um, so seeing how it works at scale and maybe scaling it back to your production levels. Um, so I would say come out to Kutztown and come hang out with us and we can talk all about composting. Um, does Rodale offer branding classes to help on branding or rebranding a farm? That's not something that we currently do specifically, but it's something that we can help you with uh, depending on uh, maybe other farms that we work with in your area or doing a little bit of market research. Um, that's something we could we could do with we could work with as well. Are you taking any volunteers or interns on your farm? Uh, always, I tell anyone who wants to volunteer that beer and pizza is always included. So anytime anyone wants to come out, um, just reach out and we can set something up. But um, yeah, I would also suggest reaching out to Rodale and seeing what what kind of opportunities are around here too, especially if you're if you're local to to Kutztown, Pennsylvania, or if you're near any of our other uh, regional resource centers that we have now around the country. So yeah, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions, whether it's to me, to another farmer at a farmer's market or to, to someone at, at like the, the Rodale Institute. Uh, let's see. Has Rodale done any work in the tropics with green manures and no-till and heavy clay? 
That I'll, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on. Um, not that I'm overly aware of, but um, certainly using green manures and no-tilling or working with, with different types of soil are all things that we've done. So maybe we haven't done a project specifically with that, but um, can use the knowledge of the people we hear, we have here at the Institute to, to kind of answer that question. Any essential farm beer to get started? Overalls and good boots, yes. Good boots should be the first thing you purchase. Um, waterproof boots, um, not hiking boots, not uh, like splashing around in the rain boots, but professional warm um, boots are probably the first thing that you should purchase. And then maybe I would say you can wear anything on the farm, um, anything. So um, overalls maybe, but I would say boots. And then maybe second would be a pair of gloves because your hands are going to get torn up. So some boots and some gloves are probably the two best things that you can do for yourself and your feet and your hands are the two things that you'll use the most. So protect them whenever you can. Also, maybe before either of those two, buy some sunscreen. Don't get sunburn, don't get sun poisoning, don't get skin cancer, just take care of your body. You're gonna need it for a long time in farming. So do what you can as preventative as you can. All right. With that, I think we are finishing up. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. My phone number and email are here at the bottom. Um, and I look forward to talking to, to each of you.